Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us here this morning uh, on this first session of Plastics 101. My name is Nikhil Venkat. I am an application engineer here at uh, Kitiv, and I am an Autodesk certified specialist in mold flow and finite element analysis and CFD, the simulation overall um, here at Kitiv. And I'm joined today by Brian Pelly, who is the Mofo Technical Specialist at Autodesk. Brian, do you want to introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you, uh, Nikhil, for inviting me, and thanks for everyone that's uh, attended. Yeah, and as uh, Nikhil mentioned, I am uh, a Mofo specific plastics engineer, technical specialist with Autodesk. Thanks for that, Brian. So the reason we're here today is a continuation, really, an extension of our purpose and uh, why we really exist, uh, Kativ as a company, which is to make our partners more competitive and successful with the help of support, uh, training, guidance, and of course, software and technology. As I mentioned, I, I am an Autodesk certified specialist and Kativ is an Autodesk Moleflow certified uh, specialized partner. What that means is that we, as a partner, have the expertise to um, to sell, to train and implement, um, sell to our customers and train and implement, implement MoFlow software because it is such a um, specialized product, right? So Autodesk went through uh, this entire certification uh, process with the, with the partners and now um, this team of Kativ uh, experts, we are now certified um, in MoFlow and other advanced manufacturing technologies as well. That's a great point, Nikhil. Um, and you might uh, want to go back to the original uh, opening slide just to talk about um, that interaction with advanced manufacturing as well as connections with other products such as ANSYS FEA, and there are workflows and relationships with mold flow as molded data to FEA, such as ANSYS, and also partnerships with uh, the Fusion 360 platform as far as a geometry optimizer analysis prep tool, um, specific partnership with Autodesk and ANSYS as well, just to kind of explain the, the environment here. Thanks. Absolutely. Thanks for that, Brian. So a quick uh, agenda of, of what we're going through today, just a quick review. So we'll start with a background of, you know, water plastics, where they're used, you know, what, what really constitutes a plastic, right? So we'll, we'll talk about all of that. We'll talk about the materials. Uh, we'll talk about the four pillars of, of plastic design. And these are the, the four pillars that you always need to consider. And we'll then look into design exploration, which is, in my opinion, the most fun part um, of plastic design. So to start off, you know, look around us and most things that we see, most things that we use on a regular basis, they have some relationship with plastics. They have some plastics in them or most things that we manufacture um, have, you know, some plastic components that are essential to actually make them run. The traditional design process, the traditional manufacturing processes, all of these are, are great. They're just not suitable for the complexity of plastic parts. Plastic parts, are, you know, they're consumer products, they're handheld products. There's so many factors that go into designing them. So we use a specific manufacturing process, which is, of course, injection molding. It is, as I mentioned, the most common method uh, for manufacturing plastic components. And the process as well is, uh, it's slightly different than what we're regularly used to. You have molten plastic that flows down uh, hopper that gets eventually injected into a mold. And once that part or once the plastic cools, it's ejected, it's ejected from the mold. The materials, uh, the material, the plastic material starts off in the form of pellets and they're, like I mentioned, forced into the, into the mold cavity. Uh, once, as you can see there, once the plastic is actually hardened inside the mold, it is then removed and ejected. This injection molding machine is not a particularly simple machine, as you can see. It's got several components to it, and you know we can use injection molding software like Moleflow to actually look at how the entire molding process 
affect a single part, right? So uh, because of shrinkage issues, because we're we're essentially cooling a, a part that's been injected into a mold, material, extra material does get eventually packed, and this just goes through the process. Now, the mold flow community is quite large, the injection molding community in general. And depending on, on how, how much you use plastics, injection molding and the results from injection molding can affect you know, marketing. Uh, let's say you're using an injection molding software and you're trying to make bids on a certain uh, contract. Maybe you, wanna, you, know, you, you might want to use those results as validation of your process. For industrial design, if you're a, if you're a mold manufacturer or a, or a part manufacturer even, the, the design of the industry is going to depend on the molding cycle time. Materials and processes, this one is, of course, an obvious one. User experience, so as I mentioned, a lot of plastic components are consumer products. They're handheld devices, ergonomics, aesthetics. They're all big, big parts of whether a design is good or not. And, of course, product integrity, engineers or analysts, you know, your simulation engineers making sure that the the product is actually going to be safe and it's going to hold up in its in its conditions, operating conditions. But of course, the biggest one, and this is what I think most of us are going to uh, think about when we when we talk about injection molding software, is part design. This is something that we're going to spend quite a bit of time talking about over the next few sessions. And our major focus is, of course, going to be on part design. Now, once again. Even with the, the idea of just part design, you've got so many different stakeholders. You've got material suppliers who are involved in the part design, you've got uh, molders, and you've got mold makers, you've got uh, folks that perform, perform services, like for example, you know, prototyping or design analysis, et cetera. And of course, you've got the person that, or the, the team that acts as the, kind of the liaison between all of these different stakeholders, right? Making sure that a project is on track, making sure that it's, it's within budget, et cetera. So there's so many different stakeholders here. And so when we talk about injection molding, the process is, well, it's, it's kind of linear, like the traditional product development process, right? The typical injection molding process involves concept modeling, part designing, mold designing, mold building and then finally the production itself now the idea of this is you know just like the traditional product development life cycle if you've ever seen or ever watched a webinar about simulation in general right the idea behind it is instead of going through the entire process with just an idea and a very good educated guest but an educated guest nonetheless instead of going in to your prototyping stage with an educated guest and then prototyping and then realizing that, hey, maybe you know, I can make some changes here to, to make my product better or the product just fails. Instead of that, if you bring simulation early into the design process, um, you are more inclined to make better decisions early on. So this is about the same concept, right? So you can use an injection molding software like MoFlow to answer some basic questions about the part design, um, about the mold design, about the uh, material, right? So the mold design, the, one of the biggest things in mold designing is cooling layouts and venting. So absolutely, you, know, you, you should be able to answer these questions before uh, you make even a single physical prototype. Similarly, you know, you, you're talking about the, the flow paths or whether there's a risk of interference in, in the flow, right? So you, you wanna make sure that um, the, the wall thickness is, is optimal, et cetera. And also, of course, from a purely uh, numbers standpoint, from, from an economic standpoint, what is the cycle time? How many parts are you be, gonna be able to uh, produce in, in a given amount of time, right? So the idea is to be able to answer all of these questions upfront beforehand uh, without actually using expensive physical means. As we mentioned, as, as we saw, there's, there's several factors, several decisions that you actually have to make for molded components. And it is very, very hard and very challenging to not be able to, or to, to try and understand all of these, um, 
all these challenges beforehand, right? So this is why, you know, the you have to actually be able to look for things like strength and function and aesthetics. And there is a general perception of quality uh, that needs to be met. Now, as you keep going further into the into the uh, process, right? As you keep going towards production, the cost of change is actually going to keep increasing. The cost of change is going to increase exponentially, really. So you really want to be able to make sure you have um, an adequate amount of uh, information before you actually physically start the injection molding uh, process. Now, it's a good thing to remember, or it's really important to remember that what is on your monitor is never what you get in your hand, right? The, it's, it's never actually the, the CAD model that you see uh, is not necessarily representative of the physical model. These weld lines that you see sometimes, they're not designed, the sync marks are not designed in, in CAD. Uh, these are these are issues that result from the molding process. And again, the idea is to be able to um, make these decisions early on, right? The idea is to be able to see this before anything um, actually becomes a physical entity. So it's important to make, to make these design choices early on. Now I've got a, um, actually this is one of Brian's uh, slides, one of the, one of the things that he's, um, he's really keen on sort of jumping in and explaining. So Brian, do you want to talk yeah. about this? Yeah, this is uh, my uh, example of, of artifacts. And um, you can see kind of a, a crack there. And it's really not a process design issue um, per se. It's more like a, a, a user abuse issue. <laughs> and uh, this user in the shadow silhouette um, might have been splitting wood and tossing things in an you know inappropriate you know bucket here made of plastic from about five yards out. Um, but it's interesting where it cracked to me, and and this is the curse of you know being a plastics engineer. Any part, toy, uh, consumer electronic thing that I have, I, I tend to dissect and look at it from. Where are the gates? You know, why did this crack? Oh, I've got flow lines and the weld line that goes straight down the part. Of course, it's going to fail there. Um, and I've got witness marks for push pins or ejection, right? So all these things are examples of you're going to add oh, split lines, tolling split lines, where you're going to change how you form things from one half to another or an insert. Um, so these are all things that are not designed uh, in CAD when you're looking at your geometry, but can affect how the products, you know, perform uh, and fail. Uh, you know, not to say that this guy wouldn't try to bring this back to Home Depot, even though he abused it, but it's, a, you know, it's, a, again, something that we have to consider. And there's, you know, a couple things here that's challenging um, with regards to, to failures. Um, there's, uh, you know, designed in, um, use models now. So now we're challenged with how do we make, you know, uh, something, you know, how do we use less uh, and, and, and make it better? And, you know, that has to do with like use cases and number of uses. And we've got a lot of single use applications now where it really offers a lot more challenge to the design. How do I, how do I make it so it, it's perceived as quality, but doesn't fail during that one or two uses? Pretty challenging. Anyway. That's my ramble on this one. And, and I think uh, if you look at any plastic part, you're gonna see these things that probably don't show up on the uh, product design in, in the CAD model. Absolutely, and a lot of times uh, these imperfections are, like you said, you know, these weld lines, they're, they're almost always the, the weakest part of the part. So that's something that's important to consider. And, Again, you know, if you if you're not going to do it beforehand, it's the only other time you're really going to spot it is after it's been it's been molded and out in the field, probably. Exactly, and and that's um, really gets to the heart of your point as far as like cost of change. Well, it's it's really what what happens in in our industry is you run out of money and time, and so then it's time to 
stop pointing fingers and you need to make a compromise <laughs> in our quality um, and, and process capabilities. So always comes down to a compromise if there's no good solution. <laughs> there are four um, key pillars, if you want to call them, of injection molding. And we talked about this kind of in a, in, in a mixed bubble, but let's talk about them individually now, right? Let's talk about process, part design, mold design, and material. These are the four main, uh, the four key pillars, the four big headings that you need to consider when you're talking about um, injection molding. The process, uh, these are some of the, some of the capabilities of Autodesk Moldflow Insight. Uh, I'm not gonna list them, I'm not gonna go through them one by one. The biggest one that we're of course going to, um, going to focus on is thermoplastics. And this here is a, is a little video. Uh, presumably the, the delay at the, at the start is the, the pellets actually getting, getting heated and molten. But you'll see here that there's actually a, a packing action going on. And once once the cavity has been completely filled, you'll see that uh, the part actually eventually will eject from the mold. But again, you know, to simulate the process, you've got several different uh, different options. Whether you want to look at the uh, the cooling part of this, or the packing part of this, or the filling, or the warpage, or whatever, uh, you want to look at the the process will be you know simulated beforehand similarly you know with with part design there's a lot of different um these are just a, a few uh guidelines really they're not even rules they're just guidelines that that you should be following in in part design but then again you've also got these extremely complex parts so there are definitely ways to get around this again it's about understanding and identifying whether your capabilities, your molding capabilities are actually able to manufacture or mold these parts. That's a great point because um, guidelines are kind of a starting point, but they're just that. They're not based on you know, your specific application and, and the guidelines conflict each other. It's like we say uniform walls, but we need to apply drafts so we can get this part out of a mold. And right there, we've, we've kind of violated uniform walls. And there's all sorts of an examples of where, that's where you know, simulation can help be the referee is, can, can we still make this um, to meet you know, the performance and quality criteria for the particular application? Um, so there's always gonna be violations and there's always going to be a need for a way to validate whether that's going to hurt you or not. Yep, absolutely. It comes down to you want to make these big expensive decisions with more information or less. And I would think you'd always um, lean towards the more. So similarly with, with mold design, um, the idea is to you know replicate your, your design intent. So don't, for instance, design a mold as a separate entity just by itself. Make sure that it actually fits the part that you're trying to make. So there's there's a lot of different guidelines. Again, you know, this is by no means exhaustive. There's um, there's several different considerations as well, and we'll focus on this in in the upcoming sessions. So I have a bit of a, a tongue-in-cheek question, I suppose. Uh, what is the most expensive mold you've ever made? So I see that the, I know there are some mold makers here, and I'm sure the designers here as well uh, have certainly been in, involved in uh, creating molds and creating parts that didn't quite go so well. So, what is the most expensive mold that you that you ever made? The answer, of course, is one that doesn't actually make the part that you want to want to make, right? So if you're trying to create, let's say. I don't know, a, a fork, a plastic fork, and your mold end up, ends up making a two-pronged fork, that's probably a, a bad mold, right? So it, whether it was expensive or not, if it doesn't make the parts that you wanted, that's a bad mold. 
so the other pillar of course that we that we talked about is material and this is what we are going to focus on a little bit today plastics in general are polymers the word polymer is of course a, a combination of the greek words poly and mer so it's many part so essentially the basic structure of a polymer is a long chain of repeating units and so you can actually visualize it um, as a long chain of, of repeating units and depending on the structure of these plastics um, depending on the arrangement of of the different molecules the additives that you have in there additives are a big 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 part of what um, what controls the behavior of a certain material but depending on what you have in there and how it's it's structured you may have completely completely different um, behaviors and completely diff different different uh, structures even if you have the same kind of um, or the similar starting point, right? A similar uh, polymer to start with. That's a great point. Um, it's all about the chemistry and uh, what the additives are going to apply for um, customizing the material. And that's one of the advantages of plastics, um, having all these options. But anytime you add something, it could take some property away as well. So getting to understand that helps you not just select a material, but also understand how it's going to process and behave downstream in the field. Yep, absolutely. And you've got so many choices, right? In, in terms of materials, you've got thermosets versus thermoplastics. Again, behavior is going to be different. You've got crystalline versus amorphous. Again, you know, we're not going to go into the uh, complete chemistry of, of how they behave. But just know that Ultimately, there are, you can think of plastics kind of like a snowflake, right? Each one is going to be unique. So no molecule will have the same molecular rate, for instance. Uh, nothing, no, no pellet, no single pellet. As we mentioned, plastics are in, in terms of, uh, in the form of pellets before they, they're actually molten down. No two pellets will have the same amount of additives. Their properties are not distributed uniformly across the different directions. They may be, and if they are, then great. They most certainly uh, can be completely, completely uh, unique. Now, again, we've got so many different choices. Thermoplastics are, you know, they can be heated and reformed uh, over and over again. So, you know, you can, they can be recycled. Um, Amorphous, again, amorphous plastics are the ones that'll have the uniform uh, structure throughout the, the molding cycle. And then, of course, crystalline, um, semi-crystalline, they have compact molecular structures um, when they are actually cool. But once they're heated, they tend to be amorphous. Yeah, and that brings up this slide here. Um, and I'll save some time and just focus on the, the two liter PET bottle. But um, as you mentioned, um, it, the state of an amorphous um, material being like transparent versus crystalline, more opaque, and uh, amorphous, more ductile, tough versus uh, crystalline, being somewhat rigid. Um, so even if you choose a, a crystalline material, it's not. 100% crystalline. There's variations in, in the microstructure as far as amorphous and crystallinity, and the process also impacts that. So this is a blow molding application, these PET um, bottles, and it starts with a preform that's injection molded typically or extruded in some applications, and then we uh, blow hot air, heat the plastic, blow hot air to expand the plastic. And that gives it a great, you know, biaxial orientation and, and toughness, you know, even though it's a crystal material. It's also being quenched to cool really fast in, in both the preform and the blow molding. But if, if you were to, uh, you know, take a PET bottle that's perfectly clear everywhere, and then nail it in your kitchen oven, which, well, the first thing that would happen is your wife would yell at you. 
The second thing is you'll notice that um, the part will start to crystallize where it actually was expanded less. So the areas that were more static, like the, the grip on the threads where nothing was really stretched out there, or the injection location at the bottom, those are the areas that crystallize first. And these are things that we can see um, in material properties that are changed by how we process it. And also down, down road, uh, what you know, heat histories it may see out in the field as well. And a, another example of materials influenced by um, process is orientation. If you injection mold a, a cup and it's a fairly brittle material, you get this orientation that will cause it to fracture along the, um, the orientation direction, right? It's like uh, a good analogy is splitting wood. If you split wood, you know, with the grain, it's an easy job. If you try, try to go cross grain, um, not quite the same. But if you use a different material, a different process, um, you know, this video on the right, you get totally different um, experience as far as ductility. So process is somewhat uh, a, a strong influence to material properties. And we can, you know, apply that if we understand that up front. Okay, so material classifications and nomenclature. Once again, you know, you've got so many different types of materials, but what are the what are the things how how are materials, you know, known in the industry? Well, there's four main categories, I suppose. There's the trade name, there's the chemical name, there's the chemical family, and of course the chemical groups. So for instance, when you have um something like a like a polyolefin, here you've got the material just soaking up all of the oil that's inside that glass of water over there. So uh, it's a pretty cool video. It's a, it has literally, according, as, as the name suggests, it has an affinity to oil. So Yeah, it's a great example too of, uh, you know, maybe it's water that the polymer is hydroscopic, wants to pick up water. And so this affinity um, can change uh, what we need to do to the plastic before we process it, like dry it. Um, it also will affect uh, the downstream properties af after molding. So if it's absorbing oil, in this case, or water, um, it's going to change the, the properties. For example, nylon, uh, we know the, the chains and ductility will, of the material actually change post-molded based on the amount of moisture it, it does absorb. Um, and that's uh, something to keep in mind as far as not just what the material properties are in a perfect state, but what you need to do to process it and how it may impact um, applications in the field. Okay, so uh, part of what we, part of the challenge that we face with plastics is, you know, with their high viscosity and um, with the fact that they're, they're, they're actually molten, uh, you're looking at, you know, the nature of flow. For example, the profile, you're looking at, at that fountain flow profile. Um, and again, you know, you can use all of this um, or you can use all of this information beforehand before you actually start melting plastic down. So here we have a little experiment that happened, I believe, in Brian's kitchen. So, Brian, do you want to talk to this? Sure. Another reason, yeah, I might get told to clean up my spilt grape juice. But this this one image is um, LCP, and it's just kind of showing the nature of orientation and how you might want to apply that. Um, it's difficult to vision, like, uh, flow front um, progression and how that might drive orientation. But if you can get a handle on that, you can apply it, you know, use it to your advantage, meaning... Um, low shrinkage and orientation direction. So maybe I, I want to try to get flow front to uh, critical dimensions, align with critical dimensions. That's one aspect. Loads is another. The other um, issue with, with plastics that confuses a lot of folks um, when it comes down to the mold floor is uh, this compressibility nature, which we see. I add an air shot to the grape juice here just to show when you push on it, it doesn't come out right away. Um, it, and it also kicks back. So this is 
the nature of compressible flow and what makes it really difficult to take a look at what's on the machine and see system pressures um, and understand really what's going on inside the cavity. Transducers are, are generally needed. So there's quite, quite a difference because of this compressible flow. So we're looking at a lot of different types of properties. We're looking at a lot of uh, properties that influence the the nature and the behavior of of these materials. And some of the some of the categories of properties, I suppose, here that that you can be looking at are thermal, physical, mechanical, shrinkage. Of course, that's a that's a big one. Um, keep in mind that not all materials necessarily have shrinkage data associated with them. So sometimes that may be a, a little challenging to to get your uh, get your hands on, especially if it's for specialty materials. Now our friends at, at Diversified Plastics, um, they have this, this neat little, I suppose, um, pyramid of materials based on the the, the cost the type of material, the molecular structure, and also how they're used. So this is a great uh, snapshot of what materials might be best in, in different regions, right? So if you're looking at, say, uh, high temperature materials, for instance, you've got all these different kinds, et cetera. Now, as I mentioned early on, the uh, most interesting part of this to me is exploration, right? So when we talked about our four key variables, we mentioned that we're going to be focusing on material today. We'll also touch a little bit on process type and how you can design that process type, right? Or, or that process. And also this is exploration is not limited to process necessarily, right? It's also the design of the part itself, the, the part geometry itself, um, and material selection as well. So in terms of process types um, that we have, again, in MoFlow, the one that we use most often, the one that we focus on the most is, of course, thermoplastics. But again, you've got all of these different types of uh, processes that you can use to simulate um, and replicate your actual process. Now, when it comes down to it, um, you do need to be able to understand and figure out what process is going to is going to work best. And once again, if you're not able to do that uh, right off the bat, then MoFlow will help you do that. You can run through different scenarios, and it'll help you understand what process works best. Yeah, this is a game I like to play. Uh, which came first, the the chicken or the egg or the chicken and egg race, because a lot of times um, early on decisions as far as what process type we choose, what materials we choose, kind of unfold and are interrelated. Um, we may pick injection molding because we've done it before, it's economically viable, or we might pick a process because it's advantageous for the application like blow molding and PET bottles. Um, but this is a, a great example if you were to add, say, a thick feature um, to this plate. Hopefully we all get the uh, design plates. But, uh, it, you know, how would we approach this for conventional molding? It would affect our tool design as far as where we gate it. We'd want to gate it in the thick area to basically apply effective pressure to, to prevent shrinkage in this thick area and not put it opposite gate. But if we were to take a look at a different process like mucell or microcellular in general, um, we'd actually wanna keep the, the gas or the foaming under pressure. And then as we go downstream, let the uh, gas come out of solubility and expand and pack that way. And that, that not only changes mold design, but if you were to design a part from microcellular, it should be done differently. Um, for example, when I was at HP, we we had a bunch of molds that we wanted to look at for 
uh, microcellular to see if it would improve dimensions, uh, stability, and warpage. Uh, unfortunately, these were existing molds and part designs that weren't designed for that process. And the experience was horrible because of that, not because of the process. Um, you, microcellular may have some cosmetic area issues, but if you choose, um, say, a different thermal control for the mold up front, knowing that, you know, in cosmetics are important, you may choose something like rapid heating, rapid cooling, or induction heating, and other process types, uh, two-shot insert, uh, molding the first component, and then insert molding. These are all considerations for part performance in, in regards to which process uh, and, and economics, um, you know, coining this area to pack it out, which is the animation you see in the middle, is another option, a little more expensive uh, on the tooling side. But is it worth it? Um, or, you know, do you want to take the chance of making a compromise when it doesn't work out based on, say, a pure economics choice? Okay, so we have a case study here, which I think we will talk about. Uh, in the future session in the interest of time. A couple of things before we we wind up for the day. The big one, again, as it relates to uh, process design, is design of experiments. Design of experiments is a very interesting concept. It is It essentially helps you identify uh, what the best or what is what the most influential variable on a, on a given process is, right? So, um, for instance, you know, you you will have to make so many decisions based on, you know, for your part, for the mold, for the process, for the material. Design of experiments allows you to go through a number of different scenarios. And finally, it'll help you understand, for instance, on the, in this case, the melt temperature, we, we can see the melt temperature and the flow rate are highly influential on what causes the on, on what causes that particular performance so now you know where you need to focus your attention in order to to modify the results one way or the other yeah, another big bang for this too uh, my experience has been exploring quality criteria before you you're actually you know molding so virtually exposing your design to variation is a great value of virtual uh, design of experiments Yep, absolutely. And, you know, it gives you these interesting um, ideas, right? It, it gives you, it tells you not only what's influencing the design the most, but also uh, a lot of times it can, it'll tell you what's what's not influencing the, the, the design. So for instance, if you say are focusing on flow rate or you're focusing on um, viscosity, Maybe that's not influencing the results as much as you are influencing the final part as much as you thought it was, right? Maybe the big one is the melt temperature. So, like I mentioned, it, it allows you to, to focus your, your attention on, on a single quantity as opposed to looking at it at this complex process with so many moving moving parts, well, metaphorically. Now, this is not limited to process, um, as we talked about earlier. <clears throat> Exploration can also happen at the design stage. So it can happen in terms of part geometry. It can happen in terms of uh, what material is going to work best. And uh, one way to do that is using uh, generative design in Fusion 360. Generative design is actually, um, it's, it's been around for a few years now, but it's getting, it's getting more and more powerful and it's, it's able to give you more and more um yeah it's man based on the manufacturing process i have always looked at it as like kind of a man versus machine we're, we're going through this track kind of explaining the manual process of these four pillars and how we create data through simulation to make good decisions um and that's a, a very manual process and requires a certain skill set this is more of a um a artificial intelligence approach to assigning uh, areas to keep out loads or run an FEA um, in process exploration in regards to um, what design for manufacturability needs to be considered when 
the software generates these shapes and then creating hundreds of different options for shapes opposed to just one. We just saw a couple examples of an injection molding, uh, metal injection molding, as well as uh, die casting in this case. So a couple of, uh, of examples to keep your eye on and we'll, we'll touch more in detail in uh, session two on how generative can influ influence exploration of geometry um, with the part design stage. Okay, so to summarize, um, what we talked about today was a general overview of what it takes to, to do it right the first time, right? Um, and how important it is to explore all of your different um, options, design options, process options, and all of the different uh, variables beforehand. As I mentioned earlier, this is a four-part session, and we're going to have one session every month. So the next session is on the 24th of March, um, and then there's one in April and one in May. If you have signed up for this session, then you will automatically have been signed up for all the four sessions, and you will receive a reminder uh, just before session two. So with that, um, I would like to thank you all for attending and thank you all for um, listening to us today. We will see you in a few weeks time on session two. Thank you all. Thank you so much for joining.